Investigative journalist David Sirota, founder of The Daily Poster, which is now The Lever at levernews.com, is joining us now to discuss his latest piece uh, on Joker America. Uh, so, David, get, get, tell, us, tell us the thesis of this essay, which people can find at levernews.com, and I, it's, it's, the entire thing is well worth a read, but uh, give, give us the outlines of it. Look, I think that we've seen a lot of betrayal after betrayal after betrayal from Joe Biden, uh, the difference between campaign promises and what he's actually done, what the Democratic Congress has done, what he's done and not done when it comes to executive orders. And what we now see in polls is an entire generation of voters seems to be deciding that the Democratic Party uh, cannot and will not create change. And I think a deeper uh, uh, existential faith in democracy itself, politics, government, and democracy, that, that there is an entire younger generation that is, is, is essentially pulling out of politics uh, and, and losing complete faith in government. And look, the point of the essay is to say that the Republicans benefit, and I think they feed off of uh, politically, uh, essentially saying the system can't work, it won't work, it needs to be burnt to the ground. Embedded in all of Democratic Party rhetoric is this idea that government and politics can materially improve people's lives. When you have Biden then uh, at the top of a party that continues to betray its promises, very clear and explicit promises, and we can go through some of them, when it does that over and over and over again, it's kind of joining the Jokerification of America. And, and, and the whole reference to the Joker is that character in the Batman movies who basically uh, decides that the system is so rigged, uh, the world is, is, is so lost, that there's nothing to do but clown laugh at the entire situation. And the danger for the Democrats, I mean, it's a good political formula for the Republicans because they're telling everybody all the time the system can't work, let's burn it to the ground. But when the Democrats start engaging in that kind of politics, that, in my view, is why we are where we are seven months before the midterms and the polls look so terrible for them. I think that's exactly right. And you call it the Joker pill. A lot of people on the right refer to it as the black pill. I actually like the Joker pill better because it conjures <laughs> these really vivid images from the Todd Phillips movie that in the piece you reference how the country is still sort of reeling from the meltdown. By the way, your podcast meltdown is fantastic and a great inside look at this. People should check it out. Thank you. Um, it, it really, you're saying that we're still sort of reeling from the meltdown of the early Obama years and the scenes in the Todd Phillips movie I mean, I don't know. I live in a major city. Sometimes when I look around, it, it actually feels like Phillips' version of Gotham. Um, if you could sort of walk us through what the connective tissue is there and, and how sort of in 2022, after the pandemic, when people feel like the recession is, is literally history, um, how there's still the, the political establishment still hasn't really responded to the trauma that it induced. Right. And I think it's good to start in the early Obama years where you had a president who got elected with a big mandate to deal with a financial crisis, who really spent most of his political capital uh, rescuing the big banks, uh, not dealing with the foreclosure crisis and and frankly, bailing out the health insurance industry separately and not really solving the health care crisis. In my view, that started to tear apart the social contract, uh, the last remnants of the social contract where the public was led to believe if we vote for things, we can get good things. We did. They, the public felt like it did that and it didn't get the things it was promised. And I think that disillusionment ultimately led to Donald Trump. That's why you saw 200 plus counties uh, flip from Obama to Trump. That disillusionment was part of it. And I think now when you have Biden in office, Prom campaigning on a promise for a public health insurance option, campaigning on a promise to, to immediately cancel a major chunk of student debt, uh, campaigning on a promise to take the climate crisis seriously, and then he doesn't do all those things, and in many cases makes things worse. For instance, on climate, we're drilling more now on federal land than Trump ever did. Uh, that sends another message to the public that even though you voted for change, nothing will fundamentally change. And when you look at the numbers among young Young people, right? The polling data, uh, how much of an erosion the Democratic Party has faced among young people. I mean, we're talking about huge, huge numbers of young people saying they are not going to support Joe Biden. And you've got some pundits out there saying, I don't understand why is this happening? It's so, so confusing. 
there's nothing it shouldn't be confusing the cost of living in this country is going up the macro economy may be booming but the structural stresses facing people every day health care housing energy uh, the cost of basic necessities continues to make american life very difficult for people and people feel like they just voted for change what do you expect them how do you expect them to react they're not going to react in a way where they say, oh, the president's doing a great job. I mean, I, I think it's, it's incredibly telling that the macro economy is doing so well and the public's views of the economy are, are, are down. And now look, some of that is that people don't understand. There's, there's sort of a Fox News effect here where it's like, oh, the economy isn't doing well or jobs aren't growing. And that's actually just not true. But I think a much larger part of this is that the macro economy is now divorced from people's lived economic experience in America. Yeah, the macro economy to me feels in some ways like a game of musical chairs that had been going on for several years and young people feel like the music has stopped, everybody got a chair, mm -hmm. and now they're just standing there. It feels like a game. Yeah, and there's no sense that the music's going to play again anytime soon. And a chair, a chair would be a comfortable retirement and a, right. and a home. A home. A home that you can... Marriage, own. home... Yeah. And student and getting rid of your student debt, getting out of the burdens of, of debt. And so here you are, there's no music, there's no chair. And it, it plays into this, and I want to get your, your reaction to this. There's, there's been this, this idea percolating in the kind of academic circles that study populism that says that the way that people are interacting with politicians now is much more personal, like whether it's Trump or whether it's some AOC. other. AOC. AOC even, or some in Bernie in, in interesting ways. In, in a, which reflects what a lack of trust in representative institutions. It's not just institutions that are losing trust and respect to people, but even representative ones. Like the, this idea that you're going to vote for somebody and they're going to go represent you in this institution, that institution is going to deliver for you, is no longer taken seriously. And instead, people just want a direct connection with a politician. And they feel like they right. get that from a, from a Trump, whether or not he's de yeah. delivering... Or, or not. And so when the institution really isn't delivering, uh, that can exacerbate that. Are, are, you, are you sensing that, that shift among young people that they, they want to feel a, either a connection or some material benefit, and Democrats in general aren't giving either? A hundred percent. I think that point about the sort of the dear leader, if you will, mm -hmm. in our followership culture. I mean, think about Twitter as an example. We follow people. We follow individuals. It's kind of exacerbated that tendency to, to think of the, the dear leader, the great savior, uh, and that people are, I think, uh, politically organizing around that because they've lost faith in, in institutions that are supposed to be bigger than any individual. Uh, and, and I think that's a, that's a huge problem. I, although I think it's also, it also explains the Trump effect. I mean, Trump keeps, you know, he said explicitly, uh, I'm the only one who can fix it or whatever his exact line was. It was, it was something to that effect. I, I alone can fix it. And I think that has a, a short term appeal to people when they've lost faith in institutions. And as it relates to the Democratic Party, when they are the party in power and they don't singularly focus on delivering for people and all they focus on is trying to uh, rhetorically say they're going to they're going to help people but then appease the donors that are crushing those same people they end up sounding incoherent they end up not delivering and in the short term it, their rhetoric may may sort of mitigate that oh we're going to we're going to soon fix things but in the end reality wins out and if you don't fix those problems at the end of the day you're going to see the polls that we're seeing right now my favorite recent example was here in Muriel Bowser's DC, which she had a huge ribbon cutting ceremony at the Southeast Starbucks recently, uh, just a, an area that is riven with, with poverty um, and, and violence. And Muriel Bowser's coming in to have this big ribbon cutting ceremony for the Starbucks. Um, but a good example of how a Democrat um, in a city like Washington, D.C., I'm sure you can make uh, comparisons straight to Gotham, Eric Adams. Um, there's a lot of rhetoric. And it's as though the rhetoric is a substantive deflection from their substance um, and its policy in and of itself, it seems. You cannot uh, evade reality for that long. And here's the thing. I think that Joe Biden has settled on this as a strategy. It's re been repeated so many times where he comes out and he's for unions but he's not actually following his uh, labor task force's recommendations to actually help unions. Um, he's for lowering the price of prescription drugs. 
He hasn't issued an executive order using marching rights to lower the price of prescription drugs. I don't think the public is necessarily following the granular details of this, but I think that the, clearly in the polls, the voters get a sense generally that they're being sold a false bill of goods that isn't being uh, deli deliberately isn't being delivered by the politicians who are selling them. And again, the, the bottom line problem with that is if you keep doing that over and over again, you're transmitting the idea that government and politics uh, don't matter at all, can't do anything and should be burnt to the ground. One last thing I want to say, there is one silver lining here. I do think that some of this explains uh, the increased activism in the labor movement. That, that as people mm -hmm. have, have been become disillusioned with the idea of politics changing things, I think a lot of the Bernie movement, I think a lot of the energy of politics has gone into directly organizing workplaces. And I, and I think that is a fantastic silver lining here of a generally bad situation. I, think I was going to exactly say, right. I think that also is repeated in communities. Like the sort of like people are realizing the bowling alone thing. Maybe there's a, a an avenue in their own community to sort of uh, make change and yeah. make their their immediate surroundings a better place. And other energies going into culture war stuff. <laughs> yeah. Mostly uh, Ryan's energy. All of my energy to <laughs> culture war stuff. <laughs> David, uh, great great piece. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks to both of you. And the system's answer for this was CNN Plus. Woo! Up next, we're going to see how that worked out. Stick around.